Well, hey, how you doing? We are so glad you are here for the next to the last week of this series, uh, God Story. If you haven't been with us, what this series has basically been about is we've taken the whole Bible and we boiled it down to one word. Uh, it's the word redemption. Now, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the story of the Bible, and really that story of redemption, through the lens of eight different people. And you know, I don't know if we told you up to this point why this series is so important. See, everybody has a thought about the Bible. You have a thought about the Bible, and I don't really know what you think about the Bible. Some people think it's true. Other people don't think it's true. And not only do you have a thought about the Bible, but everybody you know has a thought about the Bible. And the interesting thing to me is, is that most of the people I meet that have thoughts about the Bible, including the people you probably know, most of them haven't read the Bible, not most of it. Uh, they haven't read it as an adult. They have some thoughts about certain parts of it, but they haven't been in, involved with the Bible itself. And the interesting thing about the Bible is even though the Bible is really not a book, it's a collection of letters and stories that have been left for us, it's it's a collection uh, written by 40 different authors over a couple of thousands of years. That, that collection of stories by 40 different authors, it, they really tell one cohesive story. It's the story of God's pursuit of human beings. And if you stop listening or if you have stopped, come on back just for a second. Here's what I want you to get if you don't get anything else. God's not trying to keep anything good from you. And God's not trying to send you anywhere bad. The whole story of God's interaction in the Bible, it's really the story of God's pursuit of human beings, his redemption of human beings. And see, that's really different than all other sacred literature. Most of that's about our pursuit of God, me pursuing God. But the Bible's about this thing of redemption, of God pursuing us. It's about God being so in love with his creation, human beings, that, that God wants the best for you. He's not trying to keep anything from you. He's not mad at you. And we've been looking at that through the lens of people. And so the first week we looked at a guy named Adam, and then we've looked at Abraham, we looked at Moses, we've looked at uh, the king David, and then we looked at Zedekiah, who was really the last king, and we went that God didn't want to pay us back for wrongdoing. He's trying to win us back. And then last week, we talked about Jesus. And today, we're in the next to the last. There are only two of these left. And I have to tell you, though Jesus is such a highlight in the story, and he's really the key in the story, this chapter is my favorite chapter in the story because today, we're going to talk about me. Now, not just me. I know some of you are thinking, wow, egotistical pastor. I'm going to talk about him uh, it's really me and you. I want to talk about our chapter in the story. Because even though you might not know it, you or I are alluded to in the story. We're included in God's story. And what I want to talk to you about is our place, our chapter in the story of God. That's what we're going to look at together today. And it really has to do with something that to sort of get at this, uh, this chapter has to do with something that I hate. Uh, I mean, I hate it. I hate it in all kinds of settings, but I'll tell you when I particularly hate it. I hate it when I uh, go to a restaurant. I hate it when Becky and I go to a restaurant. I hate it when me and some friends or me and my family or you notice the combination do nominators of me. I hate it when I go to a restaurant, you get out of your car and you park and you walk up to the door and there you see it, what I call the line of the damned everybody's lined up, and they're just waiting. And they got their heads down, and they're trying to carry on polite conversation these days. Everybody's staring at their phone, and they got that little electronic thing that's going to let them know when they have been chosen. And you just have to wait. I hate waiting in a restaurant for food. I hate waiting at a doctor's office in the waiting room. I hate waiting when I have to go get driver's license. I hate to wait. How about you? How do you do with waiting? It's been my experience that most of us are too good with it. And the interesting part is, is that our chapter in the redemption story, our chapter is a, is a, is a lot about waiting. And really, our chapter is characterized by, by questions, I guess questions like this. Uh, when, God? 
When, God, are you going to make it right? When, God, is this suffering going to end? When, God, are you going to make diseases go away? When, God, are you going to punish evil people? When, God, are the things that I hate going to get set right in this world? When there's going to be justice? When is the things in my life going to be right? When, God, when is this going to happen? I mean, that's what we all want to know. We don't know when everything that we're worried about, it, it, it just frustrates us that we have to wait on God to do whatever he's going to do. And the good news I have for you is that you and I are not the first group of people to be frustrated by this uh, all throughout the Bible. Again, as read the story of God there, uh, people are frustrated by this. In fact, when Jesus is on the planet and he's walking around with his followers, after Jesus has been crucified and now he's resurrected and he's with his followers after he's resurrected. Now again, I just want you to think about that scene. Here are these people and they had decided to follow Jesus when he's alive, doing miracles, teaching everything, and they thought he was the Son of God. And then he got killed, and they thought, I guess he was a fraud. And then three days later, he gets resurrected. And now they don't think he's God. Many of them know, oh, he's God. And when they are with him and they know that he's God, here's what they decide to ask. They say, and I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to add some words to it so you can get the feel of what they're asking. They say, Jesus, we get all about Adam and Abraham and his family, and we get about the nation with Moses and the kings, and we get all that's a period of time instead of kind. We get that they had to be punished for what they're doing. You were trying to bring them back, not win them back. And when you were here and you were teaching, we were convinced you were it, and it was all going to happen. And then you were killed, but now you're resurrected. And Jesus, what we want to know is, is now. Finally, the time when everything is going to be set right. What they ask is, is now the time when the kingdom comes? Is now when what's up there in heaven finally comes down here? Is now the time? And what Jesus says to them is, no, not yet. No, there's another chapter in God's story of redemption. That's the last chapter. The chapter you want to know about, it's the last chapter. There, there's another chapter before we get there. And that's the chapter I want to talk to you about today, and it's the chapter that alludes to us. Now, I want to read to you where we come into the story, where you and I get mentioned, uh, those of us in our generation, Christ followers. And really, it happens before Jesus is resurrected. Jesus tells them about it. He tells them real directly, but you know, he told them so many things that they didn't understand before he was resurrected that they didn't get this either. They only understood it later. This is in Matthew chapter 16. If your person likes to pull it up on your phone or you have a copy of the Bible you want to open up, if you don't, it's going to be on the screen uh, right there in front of you. Uh, so let me just read it to you. Jesus is with them, and here's what he, he first time alludes to us. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man is a title he uses for himself, and it alludes to something in the Old Testament that we don't have to get to but they know he's talking about him. Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So what they say is, Jesus, people, people are wondering about you. They don't really know who you are if you want to know what they're saying. They know you're a godly man. They know you're trying to teach the right thing, but they don't know. Some of them think you, you may be a prophet. Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, who's so bold and he tends to speak out first, he says, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man. In other words, Peter, you and I have hung out long enough to know I, I, you're not this smart. And other, these other guys aren't that smart. No guy gave you this. This came to you as a direct revelation from God. Here's what I tell you, Peter. This came from my Father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And at this point, the disciples are standing there. When they hear him say, I'll build my church, they all get that sort of sheepish grin on them, and somebody's about to raise their hand and go, a what? A what? You're going to build a what? Because it doesn't make sense to them. They're thinking to themselves, hey, we know about Abraham, and you chose Abraham, and that became the nation of Israel, and we're God's chosen people. We're all Jews, and we're trying to follow that. We know it's about a nation, but you're going to build a, a church? 
what are you talking about? But they don't ask any questions. They don't really get it. They don't really get what he's trying to get at. They don't ask, but the word Jesus used for church, I mean, it sounds so normal to us. What he literally said to them is, I'm going to build my gathering. So he says, based on the truth of what Peter said, that I'm the Son of God, I'm going to build my gathering in this world. And I don't think they had a clue. I do not think they had a clue what he was talking about because they thought kingdom and nation and family and people and tribe and now he's talking about he's talking about a gathering and it's mine he says and I'm going to build it and it's going to last forever and there ain't nothing anybody can do about it I mean I think about it here we are 2000 years later on the opposite side of the planet from where he said this we're a whole another race of people from the people he said it to. We don't speak the same language that they speak. And we're here as a direct fulfillment of what he said. Now, in, in fact, just notice how he finishes his sentence. He says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome this gathering of mine. That is, no matter what the obstacles, you think of the worst obstacles that can be thrown at this thing that I am building, no opposition can stand against it. Nothing is going to stop it because I'm starting this thing in the world and it is going to last. And of course, he was exactly right because here we are. And today, here we are at our campuses. You're joining in online maybe and along with billions of people, literally billions of people today we join with them in gathering to worship Jesus. We are a direct fulfillment of these words that he said 2,000 years ago, that he would build it and nothing could stand against it. And believe me, the church throughout the generations has withstood everything, everything thrown at it. It's withstood you know, persecution and poverty and prosperity and power. It survives bad preaching. <laughs> I mean, every week you get an example of that. I mean, the church has become a fulfillment of this passage that Jesus says. I mean, kings and kingdoms have come and gone, and, and the church still stands. Rome decided that when it was in its infancy, we'll nip it in the bud and we'll persecute it out of existence. And what happened? Rome became the center of Christianity. I mean, in our own generation, basically, 70 years ago, China decided to become a communist nation and they outlawed Christianity and they threw all the missionaries out and they made it illegal for you to follow Jesus. And for, for decades we thought there are no Christians in China. It's such a dark, dark place. We used to call it being behind the bamboo curtain. And it was so dark and we didn't think any message of Jesus was there. And then finally when they allowed the West back in, what we found out is the largest group of Christians in our world and the fastest growing place in the world today that the church is spreading is in China. Persecution can't stop it. Power can't stop it. The world changes. Opposition comes and goes. But the church keeps going. It's because Jesus said, I'm doing this and nothing is going to stop it. People who get grumpy and they want it to be about them. It isn't about them. It's about me. And they get complaining about the music and they complain about the colors and they complain about this. And Jesus says, none of that's going to stop it. I'm building it. And I'm going to build it. And nothing will stand against it. Now, some of you have been ignoring the church your whole life. And you didn't know. Some of you have been going to church on and off to sort of come and go your whole life, and you didn't know. Some of you come and participate every single week, and you didn't know. You didn't know what you were involved in. Some of you are here every week, and you, you didn't know. You're involved in the fulfillment of prophecy. You're a part of a chapter in God's story of redemption. And our chapter, this story, the, the story we're telling in this chapter is just as important as the chapter Adam had and Abraham had and Moses had. Our chapter is just as important as David's chapter. The story that you and I tell in this chapter, it matters just as much in the story of redemption. And that's not even the best part. The best part is that we are called 
the body of Christ. I mean, that's one of the primary images that's used for us. We're the body of Christ. And what that means is, is that when all of us follow Jesus, those of us who follow Jesus, when we do our part, when we put in our little bit of what God has gifted us to do, and we greet and we love and we teach or we sing or we do our part, whatever our part is, and we do it in the way that we're following Jesus, when we come together, something happens. Something mystical happens. It's unexplainable. And I wouldn't even say this except I've experienced it so often, and some of you have as well. What it is is that when we are together, and all of us together, when we all do our part, when we're following Jesus and we're submitting ourselves to Him and we play our part and we all come together, then in this age, for, for this age, we're as close as a person will get when all of us, not one of us individually, but all of us together, we represent Jesus. And we're as close as a person in our age will ever get to being with Jesus when we're functioning the way. When the church is functioning the way the church should functioning, it's about as good as it gets in our age. And it happens all the time at our campuses. I mean, someone will start to come and... They don't really even know why they came. Well, maybe they've been invited and they're coming just to get the person to stop inviting them. And they don't know anybody or they wander in here and they don't know anybody and maybe they only know a person that invited them and they walk in and people are nice to them and then we stand and sing songs that they don't know the words or the tunes to. We play videos that are intended, we think, to be funny, but often we know they're not funny. And then me or Jason will stand up and teach on a subject that you had not even ever thought about before we stand up and talk. And then something happens. Before the whole thing's over, grown men will find themselves crying. I have men and women again and again come to me at the end of the service. In fact, it, just not very long ago, I had a 30-year-old man that waited while everybody else was talking, waited until I sort of started walking away until I was alone, and he got me off to the side, and he goes, look, I don't know what it is. I, I come here, and it, somewhere in the middle of this, every time I'm here, I start crying. What are you guys doing? What is that? I'll tell you this. It's not the preaching. It's not the music. And again, again, all of that, it's that, it's that when we come together and we play our part and, and, we, and everybody's invited and everybody's welcomed and all are included and we throw up a great big everyone, everybody come and we represent Jesus the way that Jesus represented God when he was on the planet. Jesus shows up in that. And people who don't even believe in Jesus can sense it. And it's moving. It begins to change things. It's exactly what Jesus predicted all those years ago in that day. And they had no idea. And many of you have had no idea what you're involved in. But this chapter, the next to the last chapter, in our chapter, God's changing lives in the story of redemption, and He's evident in us. And here we are in Georgia in 2015, and we're still a part of it, and we're still building it. Think about it. While we wait for everything to get set right exactly the way all of us want, and while we wait for God to fix everything we want, we play a part in God's story of redemption. Now, the real question is, what are we supposed to do while we wait? What are we doing together while we wait? Well, throughout history, I mean, in this whole story of redemption, God's made very clear to human beings what they're to do. When he was with Abraham, it's very clear. If you wanted to be on God's plan at that particular point, as he's starting the story of redemption, he had to get associated with Abraham and his family. That's the way you were a part of it. And then Moses comes and it's, it's a nation. And if you wanted to be on board with what God was doing, then you had to become a part of that nation. And they literally had people that had been born in other places that would become proselytes, they'd call it. And they'd become a part of the Jewish nation because that's what God was doing in the world. 
When Jesus was here, it was real clear. You want to be on board with what God's doing in the world, then you need to follow around with Jesus. It wasn't just the 12. There's a whole group of people and disciples outside of those, and they followed around with Jesus because it was evident to them, this is what God's doing in the world. Jesus and his group of followers. Well, what about now? What is God doing? Well, here's the good news. Just like God has always been clear of what he's up to, in every different chapter throughout history, God has been crystal clear of what he's up to in this chapter. And even if you don't believe it, and even if you're not ready to be a part of it, even if I'm not real clear, and I hope I'm clear on how I say this so you get it, I just want you to know, God is no less active in our chapter than he was with Abraham. God's no less active now than he was in the time of David. God's no less present in our world with us than he was when Jesus was here. Because we're a part of the whole story of redemption that he's telling, and it's continuing. And now in the final days, he makes clear to us, how do you get on board? Here's what you do to get on board with what I'm doing. And he says it through Jesus after the resurrection. Let me just read it to you. Here's what he says. This is how Matthew recorded it. Then the 11 disciples, there are only 11 now because one of them you know, betrayed Jesus, and he killed himself. And it's so sad. I, I'm convinced Jesus would have forgiven him too. It could have still been 12. But now they're only 11. He went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped. But some of them doubted. I, mean, I just have to tell you, when I was a young Christian 30 years ago, this verse, that one section was so encouraging to me. The people, they would worship. They'd be with the resurrected Jesus. He was there, and they worshiped him. And yet some doubted him. And that was me. I'd worship and doubt. My mind couldn't get around it all. I'd, I'd worship and I'd doubt. And the good news is Jesus didn't throw them out. And he's not throwing you out if that's where you are either. You're invited. You're included. You're, you're a part. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who gave it to him? God. Jesus is saying, just, just so you know, if you didn't get it before, what I'm about to say to you comes with the full authority of God because he's, he's given it to me. Therefore, because I have all authority, go and make disciples of all nations, which just means followers of mine. Go make followers of mine in all nations. And they're thinking, nations? I thought it was about our nation. I mean, I don't even like the other nations. Jesus is like, no. It's about everybody being included and everybody being invited and everybody, have a great big everybody for all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I am with you in this mission, in this endeavor, I'm with you in this always to the very end of the age. So this is what Jesus is up to in our chapter. This is what God is up to in our age. He says, look, I'm giving you a responsibility. I'm giving you a mission. I'm giving you a challenge, and this is it. This is a responsibility. This is what you do if you follow me. You spread the truth about me everywhere. You go to everybody in your circles. You try to help everybody come to understand who I am, that they're all included, that everybody's welcome and everybody's included and that it's important. You tell them this message of redemption. Teach people to follow me. Teach them how to live the way that I, I, God has shown us to live through my example. And to, to the degree that you accept this invitation to be on this mission with me, to go to all people, then the Spirit of God will be with you in this and strongly support you as you accomplish this mission. Now, here's what it means to you and me practically. The degree to which a man or a woman decides, I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to follow Jesus in what Jesus is up to in this age. I'm going to make my life about what he said he was up to. I'm going to get strongly on board in following him and telling everybody in my circle, I'm going to try to help everybody understand that everybody's included, everybody's welcome, everybody's invited, and you're a part, you could be a part of God's story of redemption. For you and me, it means as much as I make my life about a part of that, then God will be aboard in my life, and God will bless my life, and God will strongly 
take my life and he will bless it and support me in that. But if I want to make my life about me and tag, my, and tag a little Jesus onto the side of it and try to get Jesus to do what I want done in this world, then why would he show up for that? I mean, I'll just say this to you, and it's something that some of your Christ followers have wondered about. You know how you've gone sometime to this church, and I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm describing something that many of you felt. You go to a church, and when you show up there, it looks like everybody is sad to be there, and they... There aren't very many of them, and they're not really trying to do very much, and you sense that nothing's going on, and there's no joy, and there's no real sense of purpose in the place, and you have this thought while you're sitting there. I wonder why they don't just close this whole thing up and go do something that matters. And, you, and I know I'm talking in broad strokes. You know why you've had that experience, and it's happened to many of you. You know why you've had that? It's because when a church or a group of people get about making their lives collectively about something that is not about this mission, why would God show up? Why would he be a part of that? He's been clear. And personally, do you know why some of you as followers of Christ and you've been at this as a while, and this is true, and maybe you haven't even said this out loud to anybody, but you read the Bible and you pray and you try to apply and just feels so dry and boring to you and you're not getting much out of anything and you wonder if you've just lost it and you wonder if it's worth it. You know why you don't sense that God is active in your life? Because you made your life about you. And in the end, why would God show up just for that? I mean, in the end, what, matter, what does it matter what kind of car you drive or where you live or what happens with you if you're not on board with the mission that he's already said that he would be about? See, in the end, you see, it, it's the small group. It's the small church. It's the large. It's not about size. It's about the men and women. It's about the small group. It's about the, it's about the people who realize in our chapter, in our age, this is what God is accomplishing in our days. And here's what he's going to show up to do. He's already said where he's going to show up, that I'll be with you. And if you want to be where God is going to show up, then you get about doing what God is doing. And if you want to experience God in your life, then you get on doing with what God is doing in your life. And you have to decide, am I going to do what he said when he said, go? And make disciples of everyone. Everyone's included. A great big everyone. Or is it just going to be about, about me? He said, I'll be with you if it's, it's about everyone. Or do you have to just sit back and honestly, and this is where some of you are, and you don't have to say it out loud or raise your hand, but you've decided, I just don't want to be about that. Then you know, you miss your part in God's story and what God is doing in this age. And here's the other thing we miss about this whole thing of an age, of a chapter. This chapter is going to end. Just like the chapter for David and the kings, that ended. Just like the time with Jesus on the earth, that chapter, it ended. This chapter too, one day God will turn the page. And when this chapter ends, you will wish like anything that you had been about what God was doing. You will wish you had been a part of it. I mean, sure I get tired of waiting for the day I come, and sure there's pain and suffering, and sure there are things in my life and people that I love that I wish were different, and sure it's easy for me to get consumed with the problems in the world and everything, and sure it's distracting, but I'm a follower of Jesus, and so are you, and this is what he's doing in our day. And until the day when God decides this is over, this is what he's up to, and he's left us, the church, here to be about it. And there's a reason he's waiting, by the way. There's a reason that God is waiting so long. I mean, here's how Peter, who we already read, say, Jesus is the Son of God, that Peter that we read, here's the way he wrote about it. He says, the Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, and the promise is that everything will be made right one day. He's not slow, as some understand slowness. Not slow. It's 2,000 years or it's 20 years or it's a decade and I've been in this marriage and it's not right. Not slow. Not slow to make things right in our world. I mean, how much time does he need? God is not slow in keeping his promise 
as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do you know why God has asked us in our generation, in our age, to work and to wait? He waits because of His grace and His mercy, because God isn't trying to keep anything good from anyone, and God isn't trying to send anyone to someplace terrible. He waits because of His great love and redemption for people. He wants what's best for everybody, like He intended in the beginning. So He waits, and He calls, and He waits, and He calls, and He waits, and He calls. He calls His body to go out and say to everyone, you're all invited. You're all welcome. And everyone is included, no matter what. You're all included. And teach them to follow Jesus and His way. But we know there's a bookend on this chapter. Just like it started when Jesus ascended into heaven. There's a bookend when Jesus will come again. And when that When that page turns in history, you will wish that you had been about this part, this chapter. So what does that look like? Well, if you pay attention and you read through the New Testament, it seems really, it's fairly practical that there's a three-part kind of answer to that. It, it, It goes like this. First, you decide personally that you're going to follow Jesus. This isn't about making a decision that you don't want to go to hell. This is about you personally deciding that Jesus will be the leader of my life, that when it comes to my life and my desires and my things, and those come second. And Jesus, what He wants, I want to follow Jesus. He's, I put my total trust, I don't just believe in Him, I believe Him, and I follow Him. That's why around here when you see somebody get baptized, and many of you have been here to witness, and you see someone baptized, the question they're asked are, are, are you ready to make Jesus the leader of your life, not me, not not you, not someone else. Is Jesus going to be the leader of your life? That's where you start. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of people stop. But let me just tell you, if you stop at that point where it's just you and Jesus, that's about you and Jesus. If you stop at that point, you just need to know. If you stop at that point, you stop right then, you stop following Jesus. Because the rest of the New Testament is really clear. It's not just you and Jesus. It's about you and all the followers of Jesus together. It's about us together, you doing your part in the body of Christ. It's about you joining together and that the best opportunity people in our world have to to see Jesus and who He really is is when we all together come together and we do what He's gifted us to do together. So practically that means you get involved. With, with, a, with a group of followers of Christ. You get involved in a small group so you can help and learn. You get involved in building the church and serving in the church. You get involved in the, in, 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 in the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, there is no greater opportunity in our era for people to see Jesus than through the body of Christ. So we have to submit our lives to Jesus. And we join our lives with other followers of Christ. And then third... In my circle of relationships, I try to have influence on everyone to say to everyone in my circle, everybody's welcome. Everybody's invited and everybody's included. And it doesn't matter where you've gone or what you've done or how far you've wandered away, everybody's welcome to come follow Jesus. And it isn't about me trying to tell somebody something or push somebody to something or try to keep somebody from something. It's about me influencing people and helping people hear the call of God to begin to follow in the already existing circle of relationships that God has put in my life. Now, I know that last part, that's what bothers some of you. I mean, if you're here and you aren't a follower of Jesus and you've had a friend that's been inviting you, you only came because your friend's inviting you, and you only really came because you're just tired of them, and you think to yourself, here's what you really think when you see a Christian that's trying to Get everybody saved and everybody ought to come to Jesus. Here's what you think. You think, why can't you just why can't you just relax and and let me believe what I want to believe? Because after all, dude, it's all gonna work out in the end. 
just relax. Let me tell you, if that's where you are, why, why your friend invited you and why we... It's because even though you don't believe this, we believe this. We believe that there really is a heaven and there really is a hell and that real people we know go to both of those places and that it comes down to not about how good you are, but who you decided to follow because there's only one person that's leading the way to life. It's who you follow, Jesus. And your friend invited you and took the risk and made it uncomfortable a little bit and tried to get you to come because they believed this. And here's the question I have to ask you. How much would they have to hate you if they believed everything I just said was true and they didn't include you? How much would they have to not care about you to believe that there was a heaven and a hell and not say you're included, that you're not invited? How callous and uncaring would they have to be? See, if you're offended by the way Christians tend to reach out, the chances are if you've been hurt by somebody who's trying to tell you about Jesus, I'm so sorry. It's, it's because we, we probably just didn't do it very well. And the truth is, here's what I'd want you to know. If you could ever see Jesus... You would not be offended by him. Because here's the truth. When Jesus was on the planet, people that were most unlike him and lived lifestyles vastly different from him, he was not repelled by them and they were not repelled by him. And he offered them opportunities to come to God and he wanted to be with them and they wanted to be with him. And if you could see Jesus for a moment, you'd want what, it, what the people in that day that were far from him wanted. They wanted to follow. And you'd want that too. And if you're at a place where you're offended by us, can I just say, I'm so sorry. It just means we've done such a bad job of representing the one we say we follow. And we're so sorry. But that's not on him. It's not in God. God wants the best for you. And I hope you can find that in spite of us. For those of us who follow, it's our job to be a good reflection in this era of Jesus. And to do it, we need to do th three things. You've got to personally commit your life that you're going to follow Jesus. Have you done that? You've got to decide, I'm going to commit myself to a group of followers. I'm, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to give my gifts and talents, and I'm going to do everything I can in my circle of influence and people that don't know about Jesus. I'm going to try to influence them as best I can in my way. So today, I want to ask to draw your attention to this card. It's probably on the chair when you came in. Maybe if you got here a little late, you didn't hear us talk about it. But we ask everybody, hey, on that front side, if you just put your name and an email address, really, that's all we're asking. And We're not going to do anything weird. We're not going to come to your home. We're not going to bother you in any kind of odd way. We just want to thank you for coming. We'd be so honored if you do that. But another part of it is we ask you to turn it over. And on the back, it says, my next step today is, well, if you're here and a follower of Jesus, I want to just challenge you. Your next step is probably on here. If you've been here for a while and you haven't yet taken a step to put your trust, to believe, to follow Jesus, maybe today you need to do that. I'm going to talk to somebody about, about what's keeping me from trusting Jesus. Or maybe you want to check the box that's on the right side of this that said, I'm making a decision. Today is the day. Today, I'm going to check it. I'm going to be baptized and commit my life to follow Jesus in the way he asked. Or maybe you've already done that, and the next one is for you. You hear us talk about the need to get out of rows facing the front and get in circles with other people, building into each other, becoming a part of the body of Christ in that way, letting people build into you and you build into them that we collectively together. Or maybe for you, you're in that, but you really don't serve in the body of Christ. Your gifts and talents that God's have given to you, they're used to make money, they're used in other ways, but they are not used to build the body of Christ, to help the body of Christ in this mission in the world. Maybe that's the job, that you, and that would be the check for you today. If you're here and you're just trying to figure all this out, maybe the only honest thing you can say is, I can't check any of those, but I think I'll come back. I think I'll be here at least to hear about the last story, the last chapter in the story. But this is what God is up to in our generation. 
This is what God is doing in our era. And if you want to know that God is with you, if you want to sense that God is with you in your life, then you need to be about what God is doing, what He's challenged us to do. And I don't know, nor does anybody else know, and if they tell you they do, they're lying. We do not know when this era will end. But when it ends, you will have wished that you were a part of this and God's going to turn the page and the chapter will end. And on that day, you're going to want to know that you were a part of doing what he was doing. You could choose to begin that today. I'm praying that you will. Let me pray for you. God, I pray right now for the people that have joined in to hear this message today, to be a part of what you're doing today. I pray that we'll be inspired by you challenging us and giving us the opportunity to be about what you're doing. I, I pray that people that have been sort of standing back and honestly they're following you as a little bit of them and a little bit of you or a lot of them and a little bit of you or it's really they just come to church because they like it. It doesn't have anything to do with you. I pray that you'd help them try to come to the place where they can figure out why don't I follow Jesus? All of Jesus, not of me. For other people that they've done that but they're not involved with the body. Would you, would you help them take a step to get out of these rows and get in circles? Get involved with the body of Christ. And Father, would you help us collectively represent you so well to a world and say to everyone, everybody's invited, everybody's included, everybody's welcome. Because that's what you said to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.